I've told you before how HBO's Succession, my favourite show, has a way of hitting close to home. That scene where media mogul Logan Roy roams through his cable network's newsroom lurking behind staffers reminded me of the time I worked at Sky News in London and owner Rupert Murdoch stood over my shoulder. The most, re the most recent episode of Succession, in fact, one of the final episodes of this series, was set in that same fictional cable headquarters in real life, the CNBC studios in New Jersey, on a fictional presidential election night. It was triggering, to say the least, for me and my team, and probably for anyone who has ever covered presidential results on live TV. But, of course, ATN, the right-wing cable channel at the heart of the show, is more like Fox than anything else. And the Hour Plus episode, which focuses on those right-wing network executives deciding how to cover and even call the election, could have been ripped from documents in the Fox versus Dominion lawsuit, but incredibly, to be clear, was written and filmed well before the documents in that lawsuit even came out. I mean, remember the former Fox correspondent who fact-checked Trump's election lies and said she was reprimanded by an executive to do a better job respecting our audience? Hello, fictional TV exec Tom Wamsgans. There are many, many things happening in this nation right now. There are a million data points, and we, we have to select the ones that are consequential. If these nut jobs are going paramilitary, we could say that. Yeah. Uh-huh. But yes, we just need to respect our viewership. By not telling them anything that they don't want to hear? Ah, yes, respecting the viewership. Consider the plot line about ATN's decision desk director, the one responsible for looking at vote numbers and actually calling states, getting pushed around and briefly blinded by company execs so that the race is called for the corporate brass's preferred right-wing candidate. Then there is the concern about being scooped on the call by the network's even more right-wing rivals, maybe losing viewers to those competitors. Hello, OAN and Newsmax. The whole thing with the people at the top making decisions based on political bias and not data had echoes of 2000 when Fox was the first to call the election for George W. Bush and later came under fire because the person in charge of the decision desk who made that call was Bush's cousin. But it also reminded me of Fox in 2020 when the company fired two executives involved in the decision desk call awarding Arizona to Joe Biden. And there are even more real-world parallels. The quote-unquote victory speech from the anti-immigrant Christian nationalist-sounding candidate on succession has plenty of echoes of Trump's so-called victory speech on election night in 2020. It's now clear I have won sufficient electoral votes to be declared the next president of the United States. Frankly, we did win this election. <laughs> There is also the very Tucker Carlson-esque host who gives a mid-election night screed about open borders and why viewers should not trust mainstream media when it comes to counting votes. But Succession's election night episode didn't just replay what we've seen happen already in real life. It laid out a pretty grim and not unrealistic scenario as to what could happen in the real world in our next presidential election. The central plot of the episode is about counting votes and which votes count. After a fire incinerates 100,000 absentee ballots in the Democratic-leaning city of Milwaukee, a fire whose exact cause is unknown in the episode but is suspected to have been the work of right-wing rioters, the network, ATN, has to make some decisions. Do they cover the story at all and risk alienating right-wing viewers who don't want to hear that their side would commit such violence? And there is the bigger issue of whether to call the swing state of Wisconsin, where the Republican has a lead, or wait for both sides to litigate the case of the destroyed ballots that might have swung the election. If the network number crunches had their way, they would wait and let the case play out. But the company brass, in the form of acting co-CEOs Roman and Kendall Roy, decide to get their hands dirty and tell the news division what to do. The votes that exist have been tallied, and that gives Macon the state. But you don't, you don't make the call. I make the call. We're going to make the call together. You can't make the call until okay. I make the call. Okay, so I'm, and I'm not going to make you do anything. This is the situation in Wisconsin. How would you feel if we were to not call it, call it, but... Um, like pending. We could call it pending. You could even explain it. We can get a camera on you to explain it to people. Spoiler alert, the CEOs never give their election guru the chance to explain it to the viewers. HBO's producers call the episode America Decides, a dark joke because the election in question is actually decided by two rich siblings battling their demons and daddy issues from a Manhattan office building. As someone who has covered the darkest threats to democracy and also Wisconsin's dangerous drift away from democracy... The idea that the supporters of a far-right candidate could just destroy Democratic Party ballots and steal the election was both terrifying to see unfold on screen and almost believable. But what would actually happen in that scenario, in the real world? 
On succession, there's a nod to the fact it could end up in the courts. But how would that work? Would the Supreme Court have to get involved? And would a fire that eliminated ballots in a crucial swing state in 2024 even be allowed to determine the outcome on election night? Let's ask the experts. Claire Woodall Vogue is executive director of the Milwaukee Election Commission, and she consulted on this episode of Succession. And Rick Hassan, professor at UCLA School of Law, NBC News, and MSNBC election law analyst, is one of our nation's top election law experts. Rick wrote a piece for Slate this week with the title, What the Courts Would Do If the Succession Fire Played Out in Real Life. Thank you both for joining me. Claire, how did you get involved in this episode, and why did the show's writers pick Wisconsin for this election scenario? So I'm not sure why they chose Wisconsin, other than the fact that we're one of the, you know, pivotal swing states. Um, but I was connected to the writers through Ben Ginsburg, who um, I am on the Election Official Legal Defense Network's advisory board, and he has become a friend, but he is also a political consultant for the show. And Rick, I was watching this episode on Sunday and wondering what would actually happen. One of the Roy siblings raises the idea of a revote in Wisconsin. Let's have a watch. Okay, and we're not waiting for burned votes, so we call. It. No, I, I right? think I think they have to hold it again. No, I, I, a, a revote. Uh, I would say revote is incredibly rare and complex because while we theoretically know everyone who requested an absentee ballot, we don't entirely know how many turned them in, and there's nothing in Wisconsin law that really covers what to do. Exactly, you can't do it. Boom. Rick, would a revote be an option in real life? Election law expert Roman Roy says no. Well, you know, uh, it's not surprising to me that uh, people like Claire and Ben were involved in this episode, because usually when I watch these TV election law scenarios, they're completely uh, off the charts and not realistic. This one was scarily real and with no clear answer. The closest analog we have is the 2000 disputed election in Florida. Yes. You may remember those voters who voted with the butterfly ballot in Palm Beach County, thought they were voting for uh, Al Gore, but were actually voting for Pat Buchanan. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, uh, dean of UC Berkeley's law school, went and asked for a revote in Florida, said oh, those people should get to vote again. And the court said, no, there's, a, there's questions under state law, but there's also a federal question because there's a federal statute that says everyone has to vote for president on the same day or by the same day, by election day. Not clear what would happen if a either a state or federal court tried to order a revote and of course, that would end up in the United States Supreme Court. Claire, in April, the Wisconsin Supreme Court flipped from conservative to liberal control for the first time in 15 years after an election denier lost his race. What would happen if a case like this ended up before the Wisconsin Supreme Court, before we even get to the United States Supreme Court? You know, I think the first thing that we would ask for, and we saw this in spring of 2020 when Wisconsin had our pandemic election, is we would ask for all election results to be held um, in Wisconsin so that we wouldn't have the situation play out like it did on the show where we have partial results and it looks like it's going to go um, to the Republican candidate. Because if you were going to make the case for a revote, um, you would want to be able to say that no one knows what the results are yet. And we did have that actually play out in spring of 2020 in our state. Um, but we also would know exactly who has cast an absentee ballot and who had returned it, because that is all tracked in the database. Yeah, something they discuss on the show. Do we know for sure, theoretically or not? Rick, you wrote this for Slate. Now you know why my skin was crawling after Sunday's succession episode. No clear answers. A situation fanned by media disinformation that could further undermine voter confidence in both the election system and the judiciary. Potential disenfranchisement, first by fire, second by judiciary. I mean, you also mentioned the Moore v. Harper independent state legislature case that's going on. How would the U.S. Supreme Court rule in a case like this, the 6-3 conservative majority? Well, look, all bets are off. Uh, in the 2020 election, the Supreme Court did the right thing and rejected Trump's crazy claims of, of fraud and, and a, a chance for a redo of the election or giving it over to state legislatures. But this would present a much closer legal case. And uh, the unfortunate reality is that in the most uh, salient legal political cases, think cases involving the Voting Rights Act or campaign finance. Unfortunately, today, the Supreme Court generally divides on partisan or ideological yeah. lines. With a six to three Republican nominated to Democratic nominated majority on the court, it could well divide along, along that route. It, it was just a perfectly crafted hypothetical 
that did a much better job than any academic could do illustrating the continued yeah. risk of election meltdown in the United States. It was such a perfect, if dark, scenario. Claire, you told the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel that the thought experiments for the episode were actually, quote, great contingency planning for upcoming elections. So what do you see as the greatest threat to elections and vote counting in your state come 2024? You know, we are always constantly contingency planning in the election world, but even in 2020, it was lot, a lot of contingency planning around media narratives. Um, we aren't allowed to count absentee ballots until 7 a.m. on Election Day. So there's always a narrative and conspiracy theories have emerged around a ballot dump in the middle of the night. Yes. So, you know, it's really kind of curbing that cons the conspiracy theories is the greatest threat. Um, and having them not become mainstream thought where we would readily accept a stolen election. Yeah, very good point. Last quick question to you, Rick. Uh, you know, people say that Fox helped Bush in 2000 with his cousin uh, calling Florida, and, you know, the contentiousness in Florida that you already mentioned. Uh, there's a similar dynamic in this episode of Succession, which is very brazenly Roman Roy is picking the Republican to win because he wants to do, uh, you know, have him do his bidding on their corporate front. I've got to ask the question. Back in 2020, a lot of Republicans said TV networks shouldn't be calling the election. And a lot of us said that's how it's always been done, stop being conspiracy theorists. But after watching Succession, I'm thinking, should they really have this power? Well, look, uh, the First Amendment protects people's right to share information. And uh, of course, they should have the power to be able to say whatever they want to say. Uh, the question is, what's the responsible thing to do? The big push that we were making in 2020 was uh, because ballots were going to come in at different times and absentee ballots were going to skew Democratic and change results, that it's important to be responsible and say when an election is too early to call. Uh, that was especially important in 2020, but it's going to be important in 2024 as well if Democrats are going to be more likely than Republicans to vote by mail and have their votes counted later. And we also know that in 2020, Fox didn't, uh, didn't thankfully, uh, give the election to Trump on air. But we know that hosts behind the scenes were saying that Arizona should be put back in Trump's column, I think Brett Baer said. Uh, it was never in his column. So let's see what happens uh, next time round. Claire Woodall-Vogue, Rick Hassan, thank you both.